your desire to bring your kingdom to this earth, mold our hearts, sharpen our senses to hear your voice, and fill us with your wisdom and grace. Help us to respond to those in need. In your name, dear God, Father, Son, and Spirit, Amen. Please be comfortable. Tough reading today. Welcome to this feast day of Christ the King, a day we celebrate the reign or realm of God. It is the last Sunday of the church's liturgical year. Next Sunday, first Sunday of Advent, and we're on our way to Christmas. Pope Pius XI established the feast in 1925 in response to the rise of fascism and dictatorships of the time. The feast day was established to recall that Christ should reign in the hearts and will of humankind. It is now celebrated in all of the churches of the Anglican Communion, the Orthodox churches, the Lutheran church, and Protestant churches using the common lectionary. The centerpiece today is Matthew's scene of the judgment between sheep and goats. Parenthetically, are you a sheep or a goat? Boy, oh boy, goats get a wrong rep here. An unfortunate disparagement of these poor old goats who are generally smarter and feistier than sheep. Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel gives us an compellingly strong image of this scene with Christ's arm raised in judgment. You know the painting. The saints are rising into the heavens. The damned are pitifully drifting into the abyss for eternal punishment. Such works vividly depict a fearsome last day. Jesus' parable offers a different interpretation of the end times. In Jesus' parable, the end is ever present. The coming of Christ is not some future event, but an everyday occurrence, and not at all like the Sistine Chapel painting that cardinals shudder at when they go to elect a new pope before this judgment seat and the decision they make regarding the election. If we want our artistic renditions of Matthew's depiction of judgment, we might better read Charles Dickens or study the photography of Dorothea Lange. Or better yet, you want images of judgment? Look at the media and the suffering of those in the Gaza, the suffering of those in Jerusalem, the suffering of those in Ukraine, and the suffering of many in the cities of this world and in our own nation. Rather than talk about an apocalyptic end, Jesus claimed that the king appears in the guise of every needy person and that we judge ourselves in our response to them. In the first reading, we are t- in the first reading of Ephesians, we are told that we need not worry or fear, for we are the children of God members of the body of Christ. In this reading from Ephesians, we can see that Christ is proclaimed to be above all authority and all power. 
he is proclaimed as the head, the ruler of the kingdom. While scripture employs the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, the scriptural phrase reign of God is the better descriptor. When we say kingdom of God or of heaven, it is very easy to think of a place. That isn't what Jesus proclaimed. For example, he tells Pontius Pilate rather directly, my kingdom is not of this world. And in another scriptural passage, he states, the kingdom of God is within you. It is clearly not a place. That means that God's reign is not a nation, a government, a political entity, or any kind of organization. It is not a theocracy, or even a church, or a religion. Matthew's great parable of the Last Judgment offers revealing commentary on God's reign. In preparing for this sermon, I struggle to try and soften the hard message of judgment and punishment, especially since we live in such hard and demanding times. Well, there is encouraging news, surprising news. I'll get to it, so hang on. Matthew presents the glorified Son of Man accompanied by a retinue of angels rising before the gathered nations of the world. The blessed and the eternally punished are separated by the Son of Man according to only one standard, one norm, one single measure, the care of others. The reward or punishment of the choices we make is said to last forever. In other words, when we make that choice, we are stuck with the consequences of our actions as a nation and as individuals. Well, that's true. We know that. We adults know that well. We do our best to teach our children that. Don't touch that stove. You will get burned. Don't make that choice. Don't do this and don't do that. Don't bully. Don't allow yourself to be bullied or else this will happen. We teach that well. I believe that Matthew's Jesus is saying more than that. Much, much more. In Matthew's parable, Jesus addresses the evil of human oppression in the best tradition of the Jewish prophets. According to New Testament biblical scholar Dennis Ham, the divine judgment parable offers one of the most famous recognition scenes in all of world literature. The assembly of the nations get three surprises in this story in the recognition scene. First, the king and judge of all turns out to be not some wielder of military or media might, but Jesus of Nazareth, the son of a carpenter. The second surprise in this story is that the sole criterion of judgment is how they, the nation, and each and every person, have treated needy persons, those who are hungry, thirsty, estranged, naked, ill, put to the margins. The final shocking surprise in this piece of literature is that the king has taken such treatment, be it aid or neglect, quite personally. The king absolutely identifies with the suffering. What you do to them, you have done to me, says the king. Those who suffer and the king are one and the same. 
like all of scripture, the parable of the end times is a judgment on the world and a judgment on the human behavior of persons who follow the way of the world. That's where you and I come in, folks. As I mentioned earlier, there's a bigger story here, a story bigger than the parable of consequences. It's a parable of choice, choices to be made. Choose the life in the world or life in the reign of God. The world is built on, built on the dynamics of power and domination. In this model, there's division. Winners, losers, us, them. In the way of the world, we use language like battleground, others, fight. It's about ego, self-centeredness, success, at any darn cost. It's re it really is enough to make your head spin and not to be drawn into these battles. To choose the way of the reign of God is to choose a different path. When Jesus began his public life, he said, the reign of God is at hand. Change your lives. The reign of God is a verb. It is an action, an opportunity to renew, to renew your world. And that action means change. It's an idea of living out the reign of God here and now, and later too, in making our relationships with others right making them compassionate, especially with those who are oppressed. The Greeks describe it as agape, unconditional love. We don't have an equivalent English word to express what agape means, but it is self-sacrificing love. It's the love we know when we're dealing with a child, whether it's our own child or a grandchild, but somebody we love, we're willing to give them anything. It's the Lakota Native Americans who do not have a word for, I love you. But what Lakotas say to each other is, I will die for you. It's that kind of feeling. It's unconditional, self-sacrificing love. The love shown by Jesus Christ, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and the faith doubting but believing Mother Teresa of Calcutta, all willing to put themselves on the line for the needy and the outcast. Following Jesus, the Son of Man, means you and I have a calling and we have responsibilities to take on, to put action into service. It doesn't matter who our leaders are in government. Our responsibilities remain the same, to care for those in need and to be inclusively welcoming. That's our job. That's our calling. We who follow Christ and all persons of goodwill need not stand idly by and watch this world become more corrupt, more hungry, more in need. We can look at the ways of the world and step in to bring compassion, accompaniment, and a life-giving change. The reign of God beckons us to walk with any person cast off as expendable in a pecking order world. Jesus spoke up. He encountered, he healed, he attended the lame and the grieving, and most of all, he gave his life and love for all. Truth be told, the journey of the way of Christ the King is not to get me or you to heaven. That's not the point. This is not a brownie point kind of game. The journey itself, what's really is what is important. As long as it serves, and accompanies the other in need. 
It is responding to the call of the shepherd. It is invitation to each of us to become shepherds. Every follower has the responsibility to respond. We don't necessarily need the images of the media or the photography of Dorothea Lange to point out the needs of others. So, what grabs your attention? You may say, I'm doing enough. I have my children to raise and take care of, my grandchildren to give love to. I have a needy mother or father. I have a friend I'm concerned about. Yeah, you're walking the journey. Is there something more to do? Maybe. Maybe you are doing enough. Maybe you're at that point of, I need to do what Jesus did, get off to the desert for 40 days for some peace and quiet. That's okay. That's okay. But then we come back to that journey because there is so much need around us here in Southport, in Fairfield. Is it UI? And what they want to do with towers and destroying people's homes? Is it the Ministry of 12? Is it outreach? Is it somebody in your office? Is it a bereaved friend? They're there all of the time. What grabs your, tr your attention? What troubles you? And are you doing enough? So let's close with a prayer. Help us, dear Lord, to see the world through a different lens and respond as best we can to build the kingdom of God as your shepherd to build that kingdom in our daily lives. Amen, and so be it.